my job is partly to join in the welcome to everyone, but also I've been asked to say a little bit about uh, uh, the idea of an open society, and I think this comports well with the, uh, the themes of today's uh, panel, since they will be discussing in particular uh, intellectual property rights as well as property rights more broadly. So I think my role is really to, to set some of these discussions in a, in a larger philosophical context. So I, I'll do that as I've been asked by talking a little bit about the open society. Now, I don't know how well uh, known this, this idea is, although I'm sure most people have heard, the, uh, uh, heard this terminology. The, the term really comes from um, the book by Karl Popper, The Open Society and Its Enemies, a book he wrote in uh, the 1940s. He considered it a part of his contribution to the war effort. Uh, and it was a very controversial book when it, uh, when it came out because it not only um, was you know, explicitly a kind of uh, uh, work that was intended to attack a particular uh, way of thinking about society, but it also advanced a number of very controversial theses about what a good society is. The m main aspect of Popper's conception of uh, the open society involves making a contrast with what he called a closed society. Open societies were good, closed societies were bad. What was it about the closed society that uh, made it so different from the open society? Well, what he was envisaging in part was uh, an older time in human history when human relationships were marked by associations in what you might call face-to-face -face communities, communities in which everybody knew each other more or less by sight because the communities were small enough that you could actually know one another um, in personal terms. And these societies, he thought, at least conceptually speaking, were in inclined to be societies in which people were relatively closed outwardly in the sense that they were closed to outsiders. People were living in societies that were, to a much greater extent, self-sufficient rather than societies that were engaged in trade with the outside world. There were subsistence societies at one point, but even when they went beyond subsistence, the, the habits and patterns of human relationships remained those of the, the closed society in the sense of the face-to-face -face society. But the closedness of a closed society is not only a matter of closeness to outsiders in the sense that outsiders weren't welcomed into the society, they also became closed internally or inwardly because a society in which human relationships were simply um, based on a more intimate knowledge of one another also meant that there was a, a limitation there that was imposed on people internally. They became societies that were much more close-knit in one way, but they also became societies that were much less likely to be, to be open to innovation, to be hospitable to, to difference, and so to be likely to accept individuality. Um, they were societies that were not inclined to accept anything that was going to be disruptive. Now, Popper contrasted this with the idea of an open society, which he saw one as, as essentially open not only in the sense that it was open to outsiders, open to engagement with the rest of the world, in, open to, to trade with other parts of uh, the world, but societies that were also consequently open internally. Because when a society is open to the outside world, it cannot help but be receptive to things that will be internally transformative. You can't be a closed society inside and open to the outside world, but equally, you can't be open to the outside world and expect not to change internally. And this is really, I think, the core of uh, Popper's point. An open society is one that produces a certain kind of person, a certain kind of character, a certain kind of figure. And ultimately, what it means is it produces a society that's much more inclined to, but also depends on its capacity 
for adaptation, for transformation, for change. And the enemy of this sort of a society is social control. Because once you become a society that's adaptive and trans transformative, or in the process of transformation, you're much less likely to be a society that welcomes social control because controls impose limitations on your capacity uh, to adapt to the way in which the world changes. So this brings me to an obvious question. What do you need to have an open society? Well, one answer that might spring obviously to mind is to say, well, you know, what you need is a society with no rules, with no limitations, no barriers or boundaries or limits. But of course, a, a moment's reflection tells us that this is not possible either, because a society is not just a cluster of individuals who are unrelated to one another, who don't share any common understandings or common norms or common rules. Uh, a society is something which has a shape, it has a structure, it has norms. Okay? So if you want to think about what an open society is, you really have to ask, what are the norms of an open society? What are the things that characterize it and give it shape and give it structure? How do we think about this? Well, let me suggest that we think about this by thinking about another notion that's also much in discussion these days, since we think uh, immigration is one of those really important questions that confront many developed societies especially. Um, and this is the notion of open borders. Uh, when we think about a, a world of uh, immigration control, people often present the alternative as a world of open borders. What do we mean by open borders? Now, one answer to this might be to say, well, an open society with an open border is one in which people can just cross the border anytime they want. But again, a moment's reflection tells us that that's not really what an open border is, because people cross the border all the time. Millions of people cross the borders of the United States every year to come in as tourists or business people or transport people. But 380 million border crossings exist all the time. But that's not what makes this, the society a society of open borders. What makes a difference is what you can do when you're inside the borders, whether you can work, whether you can trade, whether you can set up business, whether you can rent a property. If you change these rules, change these norms, you can make a society more or less open. The openness of a society is not about the boundaries. <coughs> the openness of a society is about the norms. And the norms are not just with respect to outsiders. It's with respect to one's own internal arrangements. This is what open borders means. But this is also what I think is meant when we think about an open society. So the question then becomes, well, what are the most important norms? What are the norms in question that are most significant for our thinking about whether or not a society uh, is open or closed? Well, I think one of the most important norms or kinds of norm is the norm of property. What kinds of systems do we have in place for the regulating of the way in which we associate with respect not just to one another directly, but also with the things that we have to use in order to engage in the normal business of life, in order to produce, in order to prosper. These are some of the you know, most important norms that we have. And without some kind of clarity and regularity about these sorts of norms, it becomes very difficult, I think, for a society to do one of the most important things that we do in associating with one another in any society, and these are norms of exchange. How do we exchange, both in the sense of directly trade with goods that we might uh, have in our possession, but more broadly, how do we exchange all kinds of things? How do we exchange thoughts, ideas? How do we exchange all kinds of things that we might want to share with others but also consider to be, in some ways, things that we want to protect or preserve. So these sorts of norms become very, very important in any society, 
but that includes in, in an open society. And this brings us, I think, to the question of um, what kinds of laws of property does um, an open society need? What kinds of systems of property are necessary? And here, I think, you know, the obvious point to make is that not all laws of property are necessarily uh, good laws of property. Not all systems of property rights or of arrangements with respect to property are going to be beneficial to uh, the functioning of a society. So, for example, concentrations of property may be problematic because it may be difficult to achieve the kind of social mobility that will preserve stability in a society. Consider uh, what is happening in Hong Kong right now. There are many sources of the, the discontent there, but surely some of this has to do with concerns that people have about housing. And their concerns about housing stem, in a way, from the kind of property regime that has developed there. Uh, but um, not only can concentrations of property be problematic, the underprotection or the overprotection of property could be a could be a problem. Both the underprotection and the overprotection of property might discourage innovation because if, let's say, you've created an invention and you have the rights to every aspect of this forever, then this is going to discourage others from, from innovating. But on the other hand, if you get no return from your invention, you might be discouraged from inventing something in the first place. How is that balance to be struck? I think this is something that you know, uh, any society has to, to address, and an open society uh, very, very obviously. And I think this brings me really to what is, I think, most characteristic then of an open society. What it is, is not a society with a fixed set of norms of property or of exchange or of any uh, particular kinds of rights. What makes a society uh, distinctive as an open society is that it's essentially a society that is hyper-adaptive. Because it's open to transformation, to change, it is by its nature one that has to con continually adapt to changing circumstances. And this means that any attempt to actually limit its capacity to do so is going to turn out to be damaging to the open society because a limitation on its capacity to adapt is going to limit its capacity to improve. It's going to limit its capacity, in some senses, even, even to, survive, to survive. Of course, on the other hand, this also makes open societies very, very difficult societies to live in, at least for some people. Because, of course, at the same time, uh, there are many people for whom change is a challenge, maybe even a threat, even as, for others, change means an opportunity. So let me finish um, from this to draw attention, really, to the themes that I think are going to uh, unfold in the uh, presentations to come as we turn our attention to intellectual property rights in particular. And I think this is something that's really you know, worth thinking about in the context of the open society, um, because what it illustrates, I think, is um, the need to adapt given that the kinds of norms of property that will emerge in any society are not simply given by a fixed past, but are reflections of the changes that we'll see uh, and are seeing in the world as it as things unfold. Consider, for example, the idea that you might have had uh, property in airwaves in the 17th century. It, the notion would be absurd because there was no telegraph, there was no electronic communication, there was no radio. But equally, if you tried to simply you know, adopt the laws of property of the 17th century for the 20th century world, you would not have the tools. You would need to develop systems of property, ways of understanding that cope with these new changes and these new understandings. The same might be said for intellectual property in other forms. Um, as the internet develops, as social media develops, all of these things, I think, are going to lead to further refinements and innovations 
in systems of property. I think the, the open society is notable for its adaptability and therefore its capacity to make sense of the changes and to make possible our you know, continuing operation uh, in a world in which these sorts of changes are taking place. So with that, let me just finish and uh, turn um, everything over to uh, um, the speakers who are the main event and just the, the, the very, very quick warm-up act. Uh, let me wish them uh, well for the rest of the conference and uh, let's all have a, uh, an interesting and productive discussion. Thank you. Thank you.